black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We'll be talking to Jared, and Jared comes to us from Michigan. And I read Jared's email last week about this ball of light that him and his friend had run into. Uh, it's very fascinating to hear. Makes you wonder what the, the ball of light is. You know, in World War II, they used to talk about the Foo Fighters flying over Germany. The pilots would talk about these balls of light. And it makes me wonder if it's something similar we're seeing now on the ground. And then we'll talk to Robert. Robert's actually a local guy uh, here not far from me in Washington State. He had a strange encounter while out camping, uh, doing some cold camping, where he was. Uh, several of these creatures were around him. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Jared to the show. Jared, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. And I know uh, I'm really interested to hear this bowl of light encounter you had in uh, Michigan. What was this, 2015 when this happened? It was 2012. 2012. If you would, walk us into it. What what were you doing and what happened? Okay. What did you see? Yep. So um, the re- what it was back in 2012 and it was uh i'm from michigan it happened in southeastern michigan in monroe county uh we live in a pretty rural uh community you know out in the country on a farm uh, 80 acres and uh just happened one night my buddy came over and uh we were just kind of shooting the shit pretty much and hanging out in the barn and it was probably i want to say it was late may And, uh, it was like a warm day, but you know, when it got towards night, you know, it's one of those dewy, dewy nights, you know, when it cools off Yeah. and it, uh, it, you know, it was probably around midnight. We were actually, we're in the barn and he decided to, uh, just head back to his house. So we were walk. we left the barn and it was one of those nights that you know it was partially cloudy and the, there was the it wasn't a full moon so you can't really see that far you know you can't really see like at a full moon phase you can really see out there and so he walked to his vehicle and i was walking with him to go back into the garage in the house and we were just standing there just about to jump in his vehicle and we happened to let my parents live off the road pretty way it's about 200 yards off the road and we're just, he's just about to jump in and they say, Hey, what is that? We're looking. And, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing. I've been out, you know, outside, you know, all the time. So, you know, I, I'm familiar with being, you know, on the outdoors and everything. And it was something caught my eye and it was like, I, something that we I've never seen before. And I'm like, huh, 
I'm like, what is that? And we both point at it and it's about 200 yards to the road. And it was literally about six feet off the ground on the road, I would say. But we, at this point we, we, we were trying to figure out what it was. I'm like, what is that? A lightning bug? And he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, at that, we, you know, we're both thinking, well, there's no lightning bugs out yet, you know, in late May. So we were like, huh. And I'm like, I don't know. Is it like a pair of eyes? But then we're like, there's no light, you know, we're not shining a flashlight to have, you know, animal eyes reflect. And so we're just both looking at him like, wonder if it's someone with a flashlight, like someone running or someone walking down the road. So we're just debating that. And it probably, we discussed this, it probably was within, you know, a minute or two. So we saw it out at a distance for that, that length of time. And as soon as that, he was just, you know, at, at that was that, and we're just kind of intrigued by it. I tell you what, this is when it really, we were just like, what the heck is just happening? Because that, it just literally moved within, I would say a second, it traveled 200 yards up to us. And if we weren't paying attention, it traveled so fast that if you would have blinked, it, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't even have saw it move and we're so it it came right up and we were both looking at it discussing it so we both had our eyes on it so we clearly you know within a second it was like a blur came right up and that's when it got weird so we're standing there and this ball of light is about 11 yards so about 35 feet from us just to give a picture a range out for the listeners and it's it's about 11 yards and it's right off to us and it's floating. It's about three and a half to four feet off the ground. And me and him went from just kind of, oh, hey, what's that? We were both silent. It was bizarre. Like we were standing there almost like at awe in like, I, you know, a tr- not a trance, but just like if you've never seen something like that before, you're just caught off guard. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we're standing there and we, we didn't even say anything to each other. We're just both witnessing of this. And it happened that quick that I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel nervous. It just, we were just caught off guard at that point. And so we're standing there and this to describe the light was something I've never witnessed before. It was, and that's why we're just caught off guard and just staring at it. It was, and that's when I decided to like call you because Steve's encounter, the way he described the light from the previous episode, uh, it was the same. I know he definitely had to see the same thing that we did. And that's when it really gave me chills. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta contact you and tell you my encounter. And it was to describe it. It was about the in between from a, grapefruit like softball size to like in between that and a basketball so it wasn't as big as a basketball but in between that and it almost seemed like it got bigger when it was closer to us so when we were watching it at the road it looked like some like you know i would say the size of a golf ball like that size you know so it almost feel like it got bigger it was definitely bigger when it was that close and it was so vivid bright but it was so bizarre because you could not see it. This, this light did not uh, admit any light. So it's on a dark, you know, that dark night, you couldn't see anything around it. I mean, it was just so bright that you could stare at it and you couldn't, you didn't need sunglasses. Like it wasn't burning our eyes, but it was just unbelievable that it could be that bright, but anything around it was pitch black. So that's what really threw us off guard. And like the closest thing that I can like relate it to for someone to like almost just kind of get an idea of what we were witnessing was, have you ever like drove down the highway or down the road and you ever see anybody with like the aftermarket H the headlights that are like super white and blue. They're super like blue, you know, blue and they just, they almost like shouldn't even be street legal. That type of aftermarket headlight. That's like the color of it. So, and it, it did not make any sound or anything. It was completely silent. But after, you know, that, with it being that, it was probably 
you know, 30, 35 to 40 seconds before we actually started talking to each other after we just were locking eyes with the, this light orb. And after 35, 40 seconds, we both look at each other and almost like, I'm so glad my buddy Alex was there because I would question my sanity if it wasn't for him. And so we both looked at each other like, I don't know. And we're kind of whispering because, like, I felt the urge to whisper. It was just weird. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what we're dealing with. And so being so bright, but you can't see anything around it was almost the scariest part. It just – I wanted to get a better look. I mean, you can't really get a better look than literally touching it because it's so close to us. But I'm like – he had a spotlight in his car. So, and he was only, we were only like 10 feet from his car. And so he, I'm like, grab your spotlight. So he walks and we both walk to like the door, open his door. And he grabs one of those old spotlights, you know, that has the wire that you plug into your cigarette lighter. Yeah. But it's yeah. bright. It's not like LED or anything, but it's bright. It's made to spot like fields and stuff. Um, he gets that out and plugs it in and we're still watching this and it's just hovering hovering the same distance uh, off the ground, but kind of, it, it kind of was in the vicinity of our, where our yard begins in our driveway, but there's a bunch of pine trees. So it's just, it's just kind of floating there. And it looks like a supercharged gas or, you know, like something super bright. So I'm like, we got to get a better look at it. So he plugs it in and he grabs the, slowly grabs the, the, um, spotlight out of the vehicle with the cord plugged in the cigarette lighter and as soon as he tips that up and pulls a trigger on it to look at it it literally does not move it just it almost like it didn't it disappeared it like i don't know what we i don't even know what you would call it like implode or like dissipated i guess you could say but it didn't even move like it didn't unless it moved so fast that our eyes can't witness you know like light speed you know our eyes can't see that but it just dissipated and so after that that's when we actually started like feeling the nervousness like we both were like what do, what do we do at that point you know i mean what would you do yeah you what know? do you do and it's such a bizarre thing to see i've seen them and you're right it's a real brilliant it's a pretty light to look at it's not like you know, it's a real pretty soft light, but they're bright. At least the one that I saw was bright. And yeah, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. I don't know what they are. What's your gut tell you as far so as... So there's, you know, I had, what, there's been 2012, so I've had some time to think about it. And, you know, there's two theories that, you know, the, mo the most realistic thing that I could come up with is, okay, one is that it's some type of life form other than what human beings know of either from this planet or not this planet, you know, something with intelligence because, or the other case would be something natural, you know, natural phenomena, or weather related. I don't know if you've mentioned and people have brought up ball lightning. Have you, if you've mentioned that in your past episodes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're kind of throwing the idea around like ball, like trying to be most realistic about it, like ball light, you know, ball light and this and that. But when, when he, after that disappeared, it really, we both were actually like, we felt like almost like we were being checked out, you know, like it felt like it felt whatever that light form was. It felt like me and him both felt like we were being observed. Like it was not like that rain. If, like if it was like a natural ball lightning, you would say that ball could, it had 360. It could have went wherever. And what Steve was saying in his, the last show is it was directly following the power lines, like with a with a purpose, you know. And that's what this ball of light felt like. Like it literally could have went anywhere, and it was on the road, at, you know, 200 yards away. And we're discussing it, pointing our fingers, like, oh, what is that, you know? And it felt like it literally came right up to, you know, I mean, it came right up to us. So it could have went anywhere, but it chose to come to us. So why is it being drawn to us? If it was something natural, the only thing I can think of is, you know, supposedly, you know, magnetic, electric magnetivity, you know, I don't know how much our human bodies give off that, you know, 
mean, I know power lines would, but what do you think? Do you think we give off that? I'm not, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm sure we do to some ex- to some extent. You know, the thing with the ball of lightning, I, I don't know that these things are a ball of lightning. I'm sure you can explain some of them away as ball of lightning. Ball of lightning is pretty rare, really. Um, and they don't come to you like what you're describing. Um, I don't know if you've ever, and this has been going on for a long time in World War II, uh, the fighters over Germany, uh, the pilots would talk about, they called them Foo Fighters. I know for a lot of people listening, it's not a band. That's yeah. what they called them was Foo Fighters. And there were balls of light that would follow the planes around. And uh, oh. if you read a lot of accounts from World War II and a lot of those pilots, they'll say that they were intelligently controlled. They thought it was a weapon the Nazis were using. Okay. Um, and I think, I mean, if you were just to ask my opinion, I don't really know, but um, I tend to think they're more of um, like a ghost or a spirit. That's the only thing I can come up with. And that's just, yeah. uh, I'm yeah, just throwing it the, out. Yeah. I, and the only, like, I'm, the only reason why I don't think it's something like that, because I've had, you know, unexplainable things happen in my parents' house before. And their house is, you know, it's a fairly new house. And I'm not saying that has anything to do with it. But, like, I've had stuff, we, like, heard voices before, stuff like that in the past. And, like, spiritual, you know, like, almost like, like you said, go, you know, that type of stuff. But it didn't feel like that for me. Like, it didn't feel like a trapped entity, like it's not anything like that. It literally, it felt to me like almost like it was intelligent. It was like, it, it was almost something that we, I don't know, something more, something that we don't know, you know, us human beings have no idea about. Um, it, and it, the, the, the amount, the impressive thing was obviously the color and how bright it was, but the way that it could move. I mean, I've never witnessed anything that could move, that fast with you know and silent that was like the weirdest thing and you think if it was giving off noise i mean us being like 11 yards away from it that we it we would have heard if it did you know did put off any type of sound but the weird thing was is after we had dissipated and we hung out for a little, we actually went back in the garage and we're like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what. And so it, we were just and fine, you know, after a while, he's like, well, I'm like, I don't see it anymore. Like, I don't think it's coming back. So he left and I was like, well, you know, guys would never say this, but, you know, when he left, he was like, well, why don't you just text me when you get home? Like, we're both thinking that in the back of our head, like, shit, I don't know if this thing's going to follow him, you know? And he said the whole way home, and we live out in the country taking back roads, you know? It's like he was totally looking in his rear view mirror the whole time, looking to see if something's following him, but it never did. And I, it, every time I would go, you know, for months, I'd park my truck parks out there. I would go to walk to my truck and that would be in the back of my head. Every time getting out of the truck at night or going to that, that, that ball of light. But I actually went out there the next, uh, out at the edge of the yard by the pine tree the next day to see, you know, if anything since like that light dissipated anything to see if I could see any charring or burning on the pine tree or anything and there was like there was nothing there's no sign of any disturbance even like where it was hovering because it was like somewhat tall it was right on the edge of the yard and where like the trees and overgrown grass was so like even the grass wasn't disturbed or anything so that was it was just so bizarre but it just to me if it was something natural occurring it just it just don't natural weather occurring it just doesn't feel like it would have floated and and hovered right there, kind of checking us out. I mean, I, you know, who yeah, knows if we went out, you know, who knows if we would have went and tried to touch it, you know, I, that didn't even go through our head, you know, I, after the hindsight's easy, after the fact, we're just kind of debating about it, but you know, I, I, it might not even let you got any closer. It was kind of like, it felt, it felt like for us, like it, it made that distance from the road came all the way up to us. We walked a little closer when we went to get in the vehicle to grab the spotlight, but we didn't, that was about, you know, that was about the closest we got. And as soon as we shined the light on it, cause it was like, well, what if we could see around the orb, like with a spotlight, it was like instantaneously like dissipated. So that, that's another odd thing. It's just unexplainable, but like the way Steve described it, the same colors, the, the light have emitting no light that that's the same exact thing we saw. 
<laughs> yeah, it makes you wonder what it is because, you know, and it could be, you know, who knows? It could be spirits. I know in the UFO world, they say they're drones. Um, yeah. No one really knows. The Native Americans will tell you don't follow the lights because they'll lead you to your death in the forest. Um, yeah. So it's been something that's been going on for a long time. I really don't know what they are. Um, it, it's uh, You have to let me know if, if you ever see the lights again out there, will you? Yeah, I definitely will. And I, I, after, to tell you the truth, I was never interested in any of that, you know, any of that stuff. Never, never really thought until this happened, that encounter, then it really, it really kind of brought my interest. Like, you know, there's really stuff out here more than what, what, you know, we know today for sure. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing it. Yeah, yeah, I just figured I had to give you, and hopefully uh, Steve's listening, and he can, uh, that's one thing cool, you know, that I was listening to your show, and, like, you definitely have something special there, you know, like, you know, I can tell definitely with, you know, the people, you know, your listeners calling in, these are, you know, genuine people telling real encounters, and just, like, when I was listening to that, it was just, like, no BS, like, I, I know he's i know exactly you know he exactly saw the same thing this is there's no doubt in my mind yeah it's fascinating and in like i said i mean they could be spirits a lot of people in um like they'll show pictures or videos of like a haunted house and uh there's orbs flying around and yeah, people will yeah. say well was it like that and i'm like it wasn't even close not even in that, the same ballpark it, yeah, and that that's the only reason why I, you know, really tend to, even Alex and my myself, tend to steer away maybe thinking it wasn't spirits is just the same thing what you said. There is no comparison in the brightness and the, the color and even the size of, of the orb and with the movement. I mean, that it just seemed totally different. That's the only reason why I think I tend to think it's something different than spirits or a combination of things. Who knows? But definitely something different than just an orb you'd see like you know in a in a house that has you know things going on in it <laughs> yeah no doubt well thank you again jared i appreciate you coming on man and sharing what happened to you yeah no problem thanks for having me Next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Robert. Robert, thanks for coming on. Thank you for <laughs> having me on. Yeah, and I know that you're nervous, Robert. There's no reason to be nervous. I really appreciate you being here. And I know you had a really fascinating encounter recently. When I say recently, I mean back in the 90s. Um, but all of this started when you were a kid in Washington State. If you would, kind of take us back to when you were a kid and uh, walk us into what happened. What did you see and what did you experience? Well, my the first evidence that I had that we had some kind of a hominid, for lack of a better term, species living in our woods was in 1980 after we had a snowstorm that dumped so much snow on us that um, the snow plows couldn't even run up here anymore. We had a neighbor with that um, cleared the road for us, and afterwards, me and my brother and sister were all walking down the road, and we saw where what looked like human footprints, but with no shoes, walked out of the woods about halfway between us and the nearest neighbor, and then walked right back into the woods again and continued on off into the woods, which had us kind of wondering what the heck is this? We thought about trying to follow it, but with the snow being four feet deep, as soon as we stepped off the road, we were up to our waist in snow. So there's really nothing we could do. We ended up just kind of ignoring that. And then um, a couple years later in the summer, I, I heard a scream come out of the forest that I had never heard before. And Having lived there since I was four, which was already about six or seven years by then, 
they, um, I was aware of all the animals around. We had a bear that lived in the field, and we heard mountain lions and bobcats and coyotes and everything that was normal in the forest. They had no idea what this thing was. Then in um, about 83, I ended up hearing the same thing again, except at very close range. And the sound was of such a high pitch that it literally reverberated off everything. So there was no way you could tell what direction it was. And I still didn't know what it was or have any clues until I heard the first recordings of a Bigfoot screaming on TV. And I was like, that sounds very similar to what I heard. So at that point, I'm starting to think, maybe these things really are real. Maybe they're not something that my aunt just tries to scare us with when we're driving through the woods. But um, I hadn't actually seen anything yet, just these little weird things of screaming and the footprints. But years and years later, in um, the 90s, I was camping with a friend of mine's kid, and um, we were in the forest just off of a clear cut and we were, we had a cold camp because you weren't really allowed to camp there. So we were, we're trying not to get noticed. So we didn't have a fire. We didn't have flashlights. We basically, I had my tent set up under the trees with a white t-shirt on top so that I could spot it through the trees to find the tent at night. We'd been over visiting my stepbrother, and um, it was night when we started heading back for camp. And we'd been talking, the kid wanted to start getting into hunting, so I started teaching him how to stalk, how to walk very silently. And we came in along this trail that led out onto this road in the clear cut. And as we came out into a clearing where there was a a natural clearing with grass, I saw something silhouetted against the skyline, and though it definitely had the shape of the head and shoulders of what appeared to be a human-type shape, it's like nine feet tall or so, I was totally in denial. I, I was not accepting the possibility that that was what it was, so I just told myself, oh, that's a stump. I knew there was no stump there, but that's what made me feel better was to say, ah, that's a stump. So we kind of ignored it and kept kind of walking into where the camp was. And we didn't see or hear anything else on the way into camp. But when we got to the tent and climbed inside, I started hearing this grunting noise and sticks cracking. And at that point, I'm thinking, oh, no, we, we got a bear in camp. And we did have some food with us, and we had, you know, rifles and a couple handguns. So I decided, well, if this thing's going to attack us, I don't want it to be in the pitch black inside this tent where I can't tell what I'm even shooting at. So I decided that we would back off into this little clearing area where the road came in so that if it charged us, at least we'd be able to see it. <laughs> and we took the food and the guns with us and we're sitting there in the moonlight watching and listening. And after a certain amount of time, everything we start hearing several different things moving. Well, on the way into the tent, before that, before we got there, on the way into the tent, I passed this shadow that was just huge right there next to where I was walking, maybe two feet away. And I was thinking, I don't remember being a tree there. <laughs> we ended up passing that one going in and out. But um, it just didn't move. They stood perfectly still. The, the only noise was from this little one that was basically squatted down, breaking sticks like a bored toddler. So other than these shadows that we were seeing and, and the, you know, there was nothing there before, <laughs> I didn't really clue in on what this was yet. But as we got back into that clearing, we're sitting there 
listening and watching, we start hearing movement in multiple places to where we counted there was at least half a dozen of them right there in the camp itself. And my friend, noticing that there was multiples of them, came up with the idea, I think it's coyotes. Well, never mind the fact that the grunting and the snapping sticks didn't fit the profile of a coyote at all. I thought, okay, well, we can see about that. I think, you know, because with coyotes, they've been shot at and trapped for years, so if they hear a gunshot, they generally scatter. So at this point, I'm kind of getting a little suspicious. I don't want to actually shoot at them, but I pulled out a revolver and I shot it into the ground about three feet in front of my in front of where I was standing so I knew where the bullet was going into the ground and not into the forest at all and then one that was in that general direction took a few steps back into the woods and then turned around and started walking slowly back towards us at that point my friend says um, I think you're, I think these are your friends. I think your friends are messing with us. Well, I knew my friends didn't have very good night vision and wouldn't be able to move through the forest like that. The only reason I was even able to find the tent was because of that white t-shirt on it. And these things are walking around calmly through the forest where anybody would have been walking into trees without something to go on. So I started thinking, oh, so what you're telling me is you think these are two-legged? And he said, yeah, I, I think that we're dealing with, you know, some of those two-legged, so like people. Uh, uh-oh. Because I'm like, yeah, at this point I've kind of shot in the general direction of them, but, you know, not at them, obviously. But I'm thinking, I, I hope I didn't make them mad. Because <laughs> at this point I'm cluing in on what this is. And I said, I think I know what this might be. And I think we need to get out of here. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, okay, um, I'll give you the two handguns, but do not fire unless something is directly attacking you. If it's not physically attacking you, don't shoot. And I said, do you understand? He says, yes, I understand. Okay, so I handed over the two handguns, and I took the rifle, and I was walking backwards with the rifle pointing back towards the camp because that's where we knew they were. And he was walking in the direction we were going. We were back-to-back back moving out. And as we got to where the road that led into the camp teed off of the other road, all of a sudden I hear this disruption up in the about 20 feet up in a tree that's at least 15 feet off the side of the road. And um, I looked up, and here's this area of the side of this tree that's, you know, maybe 10 feet of branches that are just swaying all over the place. Yeah, I look up, you know, never mind the, the fact that there's no other trees moving, just this one. <laughs> I'm no. still kind of, you know, rejecting everything. I look, oh, it's a wind. <laughs> Once again, telling myself whatever it took to keep me calm. And my friend turned around, and he looked at me, and his eyes were the size of saucers. He said, the wind don't jump. Oh, you got a point. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Did something jump so, out of the tree? Something jumped from the road into the tree, about 20 oh, feet I gotcha. up. I got gotcha. you. It was standing flat-footed on the ground next to the road, and it jumped clear up in, about 20 feet up into the tree and was hanging onto the trunk. So the whole tree was swaying with the impact of this thing. It had to be huge. But um, anyway, so we, we walked out. I had noticed at this point I'm scanning and not really paying a whole lot of attention to the ground, but looking around a lot. And I noticed that that stump wasn't there anymore, which had me a little baffled as well. But like I said, at this point, my denial was kind of fading away. So the idea of this non-existent stump having walked away was suddenly not as unbelievable as it had been previously. 
So we get out of the woods and we went to my home, which was only like a half mile away. And the kid that I was with, he says, well, you, you said you think you know what these were. No, what are they? I said, I think it's Sasquatch. He says, you mean Bigfoot? I said, yeah. And he says, um, no, it couldn't have been that. I'm, well, okay, there's nothing else out there in these woods that would convince me to leave. So if you really don't think that's what it is, let's go back. Yeah, I figured we could just grab a flashlight and go back and find out. And he's like, oh, no, I'm not going back there. And he never did. In fact, when I went back the next morning to collect my camping gear, he still wouldn't go with me. I had to go alone. And um, when I got there, in the over where I'd heard the stick snapping and all that and the grunting, I could see two barefoot humanoid type footprints that were like size 13 to 14 and a bunch of broken sticks. And next to it was another set of prints that were about 18 inches long. And there was a bunch of around, there were several different places where there were prints of various sizes. The, 13s were the smallest of them, but um, I collected up all the gear and I brought it back out. I, basically, I'd done a kind of cursory looking at the tracks, and then after the kid left, I went back out there because it was starting to get towards sunset, and I figured, okay, this, it's been you know overnight already. There's, they would be long gone by now, so I decided to go back and actually really take a look at these tracks. And I saw at that point when the shadows were laying into the tracks a little more, there was some that I'd missed the first time because they were so big that without having a shadow laying into the tracks so that you could see it clearly, the mind was not accepting the idea that this depression could be a track because it was just too big. <laughs> it was like two feet long or so. And I noticed that they had been standing where that shadow of the tree that hadn't been there before had been standing and that our tracks passed within literally like two feet of it. And I saw that these tracks became a trail wandering off into the woods and I started following them. And I didn't get more than 10 feet before I found another set of tracks that had gotten within a couple feet of these big tracks. But this time the tracks that had passed close to it were, were deer tracks. And well, I, it's kind of a misnomer to say they passed because they walked up to it. And at that point, what had been deer tracks became drag marks where it was apparently pulling the thing along beside it. It apparently reached out and killed it, which proves just how easily it could have reached out and killed us because we were every bit as close to it as that deer had been. But I continued down the trail following it, not expecting to run into anything because, you know, it had been several hours already. You know, they would have had plenty of time to leave. But I followed the tracks for about two miles and I followed the tracks until they led into this opening and I was about 10 feet in front of me where the tracks had led into, I saw what looked like an old rotten log, you know, when the bark falls off of it, it's kind of like stringy and brown looking. Yeah. But there, there aren't any in that forest. I knew that there hadn't hadn't been, and besides the tracks led right to it. <laughs> so I realized at that point that that was not a log. It was something big and hairy and apparently asleep because it didn't move. But I sure didn't want to be the one to wake it up. 
So once again, I find myself walking backwards, this time with nobody looking where I'm going. I walked backwards for about 20 feet, and then I turned around and started walking faster out of there. And I didn't, I didn't go tracking them again after that. But um, I, no, I didn't really want to tell anybody because I was worried, you know, that people would go out and try to hunt them and stuff. And they had their chance. They could have killed me. They didn't. So I didn't see any reason why anybody should harm them. But um, after a while, I started running into various friends of mine at different times that would look at me and they'd say, you wouldn't believe what I saw last, you know, last week or a few days ago or whatever, so time, depending on how much time had passed. And I had three different people tell me about seeing one said he saw one standing alongside the road when he was driving home just about, oh, three miles from where I'd run into him. Another one told me that he saw a full-grown tree waving back and forth in the forest. It was the only tree moving. And, you know, various reports from other people. And meanwhile, I'd been keeping my mouth shut. So when they'd say, you'd never believe what I saw, I'd say, well, try me. And then they'd, they'd tell me and I'd look at them. And I'd say, well, I got news for you. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Like, Why would you believe me? Well, I kind of ran into them myself. Well, the, the last time that I was out in that particular clear cut, um, I had noticed these where trees had been pulled up and stacked up into kind of a pyramid shape in various places, blocking trails in certain areas. And um, I wondered about that, but ignored it until I was just, I walked back on the road and around into this valley. I'd um, just finished building an M4 rifle. So I wanted to function fire it, test it, see if it worked. So I dumped 30 rounds into the dirt in this hidden valley back around the corner and um, didn't think anything of it. You know, it worked fine, went home. And the next time I went back out to that same valley, there was one of these pyramid things was built in the middle of the road, blocking me from going back there. And at that point, I caught on that these things were basically the equivalent of a no trespassing sign. You know, it was telling me, don't go here. Uh, I hadn't realized that they'd been back in the valley, but I didn't know. As far as I know, these things have probably been watching me for most of my life. <laughs> because, like I said, there's all these years of very spaced out things that were like the tracks when I was a kid or the screams and the one scream was like literally at such close range. I couldn't even tell where it was coming from. So uh, I caught on to the fact that, okay, they're telling me not to go back there. So that told me that that's probably where they were staying was right in that area, which made sense because it was pretty much the most isolated place in that area. There's, free access to water and everything that they would need, but not going to get bothered by too many people. So I never went back into that valley. Did you ever but, encounter um, them again? Did you ever come across them well, again? I, I did one other time that um, there was something that happened. I was taking a walk with my dog here um, last winter. And I was walking on this trail in amongst a bunch of rock formations and trees and stuff. And we were kind of standing there looking around. And I kind of saw something dark dropping out of a tree and heard the impact on the ground sounded like something that had to be at least 500 pounds. And unlike where a bear, if a bear fell out of a tree and landed on its butt or whatever, you're going to kind of hear a grunt so noise when they let out their air. This thing was completely silent. Fortunately, my dog also stayed silent because I didn't really want to 
piss them off. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, at minimum, you're dealing with a large bear, and at maximum, it could have very easily been a Sasquatch. So there again, the behavior didn't seem like a bear. And I'd been around bears my entire life. Like I said, we had a bear that lived in the field with our horses. So I'm standing there with my hand on the butt of the gun, my other hand on the dog's leash, just staring in that direction. It's like, okay, your move, you decide. And when nothing happened, I just kind of slowly got out of there with the dog and left. I don't know now, but I think maybe at the time they were living in a cave down there because just a couple months previous to that, I'd spotted this cave and I started approaching it and something was moving just inside the entrance. And I, you know, didn't know what it was, but things that live in caves generally aren't things that you really want to be approaching. And I was carrying a um, surplus pistol that all it will fire is full metal jackets and you don't want to fire those towards rocks anyway. So there again, I decided that it was time to get out of there. But yeah, yeah so far that. that's basically the, those two times were the last two times that I had any possible encounter. I can't tell you that that's what it was. Just the, the behavior didn't seem normal for any other animal and the, the weight of it, pretty much ruled out anything smaller than a bear. It yeah. almost sounded like a horse fell out of a tree, you know, but they don't do that. So. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, you know, that whole area, Robert, through there has been known for encounters. I mean, for many years, it was even back, I think it was in the 80s when that one swam across the Columbia River and got on, for the audience listening, it's right on the border of Washington, Oregon, Columbia River separates the area. I think it was a little bit farther east than where you're at, but um, it went across the river, and this old woman used to always say they go across the river. They swim across the river. Everyone thought she was crazy. And then on the other, on the Oregon side, um, there was one that popped up and tried to get across Highway 84, and it's a famous case, but um, it makes me wonder why they're, you know, if it's easy. And the Columbia River right there isn't. It'd take a lot for me to swim across it, but I think for one of these things, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, what do you think was going on that night when you guys were you're setting up camp? Do you think they were just curious on what you guys were doing, or uh, did you feel like anything uh, bad was going to happen, or what was your impression of that night? I think they were just basically migrating, trying to find a place to live, <laughs> and they, they just kind of wandered into the camp, probably saw that white T-shirt, and were wondering, you know, what is that? <laughs> What's up with this? And like I said, we weren't in camp at the time they arrived. They were there when we got there. But I'd the ones that I'd seen first silhouetted against the skyline, when I looked at it, I also found another trail further down. So I think that they had a couple of males basically walking about 100 yards from the main family group in order to kind of keep an eye on things and protect the rest of the group. But uh, apparently walking as quietly as we were and without a flashlight, it apparently surprised them. We were too close to them for them to make any noise or anything without alerting us to the fact they were there. But yeah, their, their first thing that they did was literally freeze in place. So they, they looked like anything but something that was alive until we spent at least like a half an hour or something sitting there. And that's when we started realizing that there was a lot of movement going on in there. <laughs> yeah, like, I, you know, love, like I, I said, love your I attitude. They were aggressive. They're actually one of the oldest um, encounters that I heard about in this area was an Indian legend about a girl that had gone out picking berries and um, she got lost and she ended up wandering with them on their entire migration route from Washougal clear out around Mount Adams and I think she was like nine or something when she disappeared and when she was a teenager she'd come walking back out of the forest by herself telling the story about how she'd spent all this time with these big hairy guys 
Yeah, it's fascinating. And there's been a certain amount of peaceful encounters with them in this area going all the way back. Yeah, I think they probably had seen me enough, even though I was always armed, they probably had seen me enough to know that I wasn't out there looking to harm them or anything. I also had one, um, the same, a little, you know, a few months after that encounter in the campsite, I was back at the same location sitting on a log talking to my brother and I saw something move through the moonlight between the trees. And at the time, I had this Russian night vision scope that works off of a quartz crystal that you compress, and that activates the scope. So I had no batteries, no capacitors, nothing to tell tell you that this is an electronic device or, you know, no sounds or anything that's going to alert them to it. So I turned it on, and I pulled it up, and I'm looking through this scope, and this thing walks over to a tree about 50 feet away, sits down with its back against the tree, and we're just basically staring at each other. I'm using a night vision scope, and it's just using its eyes, and it was rather clear that it could see me better than I could see it. I didn't tell my brother about it at the time because when we were kids, um, my older brother had joked with him, oh, there's a Bigfoot and pointed it at an old stump. And the first thing he did was spun around and fire at it with a BB gun. And this time he was carrying a shotgun. So I decided, yeah, I'll just keep this to myself because I really don't want to have a war with these things. I know we can't win. (laughs) So I just sat there and stared at it quite a while until my brother got bored and tapped me on the shoulder and said, let's, let's leave. And at the time we left, it was still sitting there watching us from that tree. (laughs) So we left. I didn't even tell him about it for probably a year later because I didn't want him to go do something dumb. (laughs) Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I love your attitude. Don't ever change, Robert. There is, you know, not every report is going to be aggressive. Um, I can agree with that. There is aggressive reports, though. There is reports where... Uh, There isn't a friendly encounter. And I think, you know, a lot of times when you have an encounter like what you had, um, not I'm not talking about you, Robert, but other people who have that type of encounter, I think, get too comfortable. And I think when they go out there, I mean, you realize it because you didn't open fire. You kept a cool head about yourself. Uh, A lot of people don't. And when things start to go bad, they start shooting. And the reaction of that one when you fired into the ground it kind of walked back and then turned around, started walking back towards you. Did you feel like that was aggressive or did you feel like, I mean, what was your impression of him coming towards you after you fired? At first it was kind of, it would have started walking away. It's like, Oh yeah, maybe I'd better leave. And then it's like, no, you don't intimidate me. It didn't charge or anything like that, which probably would have made me shoot actually at it, but it just, slowly walked back towards me and went back to where it had started from more or less. And it was just standing there looking at us, I guess, you know, was, yeah, I, I know that they can go severely wrong. And that's actually one of the reasons for my attitude, because I grew up hearing Bigfoot stories. And one of the stories that I remembered from hearing when I was a kid was about a group of hunters that had shot one and they were holed up in a um, cabin that was made out of rock and stuff, you know, an old cabin out in the woods. And after they shot the one, they, that night, the rest of the family came back and started throwing rocks at the cabin and they were getting bombarded the entire night. So I knew better than to shoot at one unless they were, like I said, literally attacking me because at that point you don't really have a choice. But if I have a choice, I'd rather not start a fight that I can't win. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. Are you talking about Ape Canyon, the Ape Canyon story Um, up on Mount St. Helens? It sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. 
I had forgotten the, what they called it. Like I said, it was a story I'd heard when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, I think but every, it definitely I, gave me the impression that these were not something that you wanted to to harm, and as long as you didn't harm them, you were probably going to be okay. Um, that one that you mentioned the other day when I first talked to you has me a little worried. The that gray one you said had scars on its chest. Because I think the reason why it's aggressive is because of those scars. And one of the reasons why I'm a little nervous about that is because I have a friend that um, we were hiking up on um, Silver Star. And he spotted something looking through the trees down at him from a trail above the hiking trail. And when we got up there, there was this trail that looked like it had been used for a thousand years. I mean, the rock was literally worn smooth. And, you know, no tracks because it was literally bedrock trail. But he came up with this bright idea that he wanted to take barbed wire and make kind of a net out of it and try to catch one. And he tried to recruit me to help him, and I looked at him, and I said, no, you don't want to do that. That's just not, that's that's dumb. You're going to pick a fight with something you can't win. Just don't even try it. <laughs> it's not that important to prove they exist. You don't have to catch them. And um, I don't know, I haven't really talked to him about it since, so I don't know whether he might have tried it. And if he did try it, he might be the reason why it's mad. <laughs> Yeah, and for the audience, um, it's this gray one that gets reported in this area where Robert and I live all the time. I've probably heard the same one reported just directly to me. I'm sure it's been reported to other people, but it's probably been reported to me a dozen times. Um, And it's around kind of where you're at, Robert, you know, near the Columbia River. And then if you go north, kind of the Silver Star area, like what you're talking about, um, it's this gray one. And uh, and the reason why he keeps coming up is he has a scar going from his chest down to his stomach, almost like a sword scar. And everyone always mentions a scar. And he's aggressive. Um, he hasn't hurt anyone yet, but everyone that's come in, in contact with him uh, said he'll he'll bluff charge you, he'll throw stuff at you, he'll roar at you. I mean, he'll come after you if you don't leave an area where he's at. And he's this big, tall, everyone says he's gray, kind of a light, kind of a light gray color, uh, gray skin. And he's got this big scar going down his, you know, has hair missing and everything. And it is bizarre. And and a lot of times when people contact me about him, uh, they'll say, yeah, I I ran into a gray one. And I'll ask, did it have a scar on, on his chest? And they'll, there's always a long pause. And they're like, how did you know? And it's because he's been reported. And he does a circular motion the way he travels through this area. Um, certain times of the year, people will see him in different areas. But it's from about where you're at. And if you head north and kind of, uh, I don't know, I think it's northwest. Like you're going towards Silver Star. You're heading towards Mount St. Helens, Yakul area. But anyway, in that area, people run into him at different times of the year. And I think it's fascinating because he has a scar and everyone always mentions the scar. Um, it's bizarre. You know, we live in a cool area, Robert. I mean, here in Washington State, you go down to Texas, East Coast. A lot of people don't talk about it. But, I mean, you're out there. That Bigfoot bar is out where you're at. Um, and they have the big mural on the wall of the Ape Canyon attack. And so it's, I assume you heard the story about how it got its name. Of the Ape Canyon story? No, the... Um the Bigfoot bar, how that, that place caught its name. No. There was a guy that had moved in, I think, from the East Coast. He'd come in from the city, and he'd moved out here, and he decided, you know, he was going to totally get into this, um, you know, country life settler type thing, and he got himself a rifle, and he was going to go deer hunting and just totally, you know, embrace this lifestyle. And um, he bought himself a brand new thirty thirty, from what I hear. And he went out hunting for the first time, and he was hunting in really dense brush. And as he's pushing through the brush, he gets to this place where it cleared out. And when he stood up, 
he found himself face to face with a Bigfoot. At that point, he literally, he looked at his rifle, knew that it wasn't big enough to do him any good, dropped it on the ground, turned around, ran out of the woods, got to his vehicle, drove down to the bar, I don't know what they called it at that time, ordered four or five rum and Cokes, and drank them down, and then um, asked somebody to drive him to the airport, and he got on an airplane, and I think he bought a ticket for New York or something. He never came back. Really? I didn't that's, know that story. That's the way the story has been told to me, it's you know just locals to locals, so I don't know how much embellishment it may have taken on in between. But, yeah, that's what I was told was the reason for the name. Yeah, and I know for the, the audience. The actually shows a whole family of them. I didn't it know does. that it was the Ape Canyon Yeah, it's the Ape situation Canyon situation that they were depicting, though. Yeah, <laughs> on, on that mural, there's a bunch of them, and you see Mount St. Helens kind of in the background, and they're throwing rocks at the cabin. And for the audience listening, they probably don't care unless they live in Washington State, but it's a cool bar. You go in there, and that mural is so... Um, I've tried to buy that mural, and they will not part with it. I even threw out a ridiculous number, that money I didn't have, and they still looked at me and said no. And it's a cool mural, but I didn't know the story behind that thing. And it's it it's a cool bar. I mean, it's a dive bar, but it's a cool bar to go into. Uh, but we have kind of a rich culture here in Washington State. What do, you, what do you think Sasquatch is, Robert? I'm curious to know what you think that they are. Well, um, I guess have heard a lot of different opinions varying from my wife thinks that they're um, relatives of Goliath, which obviously the ones I ran into were anything but evil, but then again, anything can repent, right? <laughs> um, the Russians, I guess, actually shot one years ago and identified it as some kind of prehistoric human. I My experience with them shows that they're extremely intelligent. I would say, you know, they don't apply it towards technology, but as far as no knowledge of their own environment and stuff, I honestly would say that they're probably smarter than I am in that regard. I think that they're some kind of um, very early human, of course, you know, mentioning Goliath and stuff, obviously I'm a Bible believer, but if you read Genesis, you'll notice that the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two separate stories. Because in Genesis 1, man is created on the sixth day. In Genesis 2, God creates a garden, and then he creates Adam, and then he puts Adam in the garden. So that's obviously two completely separate creation games going on. And in fact, after that, all the animals are created from the dirt and shown to Adam to see what he's going to name them. So the stories are two separate ones. And it also goes a long ways to explain how their kids manage to find wives. And, of course, the fact that if you look at the fossil record, there's multiple different branches from the human tree that pretty much predate the Bible story or at least the second Genesis deal, the part with Adam and Eve. I don't think they're descended from Adam and Eve, but I think they're an earlier species. Whether so, that be gigantopithesis or what, I don't know. I've never seen a DNA test on them to see just how human they might be. Yeah, I hear you. So you think they're more human? When you say Goliath, I assume you mean more human-like? Yeah, yeah, or, or at least some hybrid in-between type thing. Yeah, it's, you know. Because Goliath would have been descended of the Nephilim, so it would have been half human, half angel, or something like that. That's what my wife's theory is, is that they're actually descended from the Nephilim. Uh, you know, I don't know. I know that the ones I ran into weren't evil. So, obviously, if they're descended from that, they're not all bad. And like, you know, the one that you talked about with the scar, I don't blame him. I mean, if I had taken an injury like that, I'd get pretty aggressive, too. Uh, you know, that's one of the ways I, I look at it. You know, if you hurt one of them, they all come after you. Well, if you come into my house and you hurt my kid, I'm coming after you, too, and so is the rest of my family. <laughs> so yeah, I totally kind of understand where they're coming from. 
Um, I'm also of mixed Native American and white blood, so there is, you know, a little bit of a historical familiarity with them that goes back. So, I, you know, I'm not overly intimidated by them, but I sure wouldn't want to fight one. Yeah, I understand. Have you? I realize it's been about 25 years or so. Have you ever thought about going, and I realize this area has been built up a lot, but have you ever thought about going back and going, gosh, if I could just see him one more time? Honestly, the only thing that keeps me out of that area at this point is a no trespassing sign. Like you said, there's built up since. I've even seriously considered coming in from the opposite side or trying to figure out another way into there. For quite a while, I even considered the idea of trying to get a movie camera or something like that with a night vision attachment and just going out and trying to just sit in the woods and see if I could make contact with them, which is kind of insane. But <laughs> I came to the conclusion that if I could absolutely prove that they exist, um, I am on the Clark County side of the line, so there's really nothing protecting them here. In Skamania County, they're considered an endangered species, and it's against the law to shoot them or whatever. Over here, it's kind of a total gray area, and I would really be worried about, you know, um, some of the more radical trophy hunters or whatever trying to go after them. And like I said, I really don't want them to get hurt. And that's one of the reasons why you're the only Bigfoot investigator that I've ever talked to about this, because after listening to your podcast for quite a while, I it became really rather obvious that you were more into the knowledge and not not wanting to go out and try to kill one or whatever. That just drives me nuts. <laughs> well, yeah, and, I, and I loves the TV shows where they're chasing them all over the woods and everything with guns. It's just like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the only way you're really going to prove one is by killing one. But I think I kind of take the Grover Krantz approach. Of Grover Krantz, he, he said that one should be shot. And his point was this if you shoot one, you save the rest of the species. If one gets proven, then you save the rest of them. And that was kind of, he was kind of like a one shot and you're done type thing. I think going out and just slaughtering them to slaughter them, um, my opinion has changed, you know, because my encounter wasn't like your encounter. And for a long time, my opinion was kill them all, let God figure it out. But I've changed over the years because you hear encounters like yours, Robert, or you hear other encounters to where maybe they're not quite the monster that I thought they were. Um, I think that yeah. they absolutely can be, but that doesn't mean – and it's weird. And, and what Robert – and for the audience, what Robert's, Robert's talking about was in Skamania County here in Washington State, it's a $10,000 fine and five years in prison if you kill a Sasquatch. But according to the government, Sasquatch doesn't exist. Figure that one out for me. You know what I mean? It makes no sense. Yeah. It's uh, like, according to the government, a lot of things don't exist. And a lot of times things are later revealed that they did know about them. Um, I've talked to Indians that tell me that at one time the Yakima tribe actually killed two of them. But when they were dressing them out, they were looking closely at the remains. And they came to the conclusion that they were more human than not. And since, you know, they're not really into cannibalism, they buried it in their own graveyard on the reservation. And from what they told me, the government came in with a concrete truck and poured a slab of concrete right over the top of where they buried them. Now, that's just incidental reports from Indians that I happen to know and talk to. I've never bothered to try to find any actual evidence of it, but I've also heard of cases where, you know, like Forest Service people would run into them during forest fires and things like that, and bodies being recovered after the Mount St. Helens thing. And it's entirely possible that they want to keep it quiet for the very same reason I did, because they don't really want everybody with a gun going out there after them. For one, it's not safe for them. Even, you know, unless you're going to send a platoon of soldiers with belt-fed machine guns, what's going to happen is you're going to end up being attacked by the family of 
things that are bigger than you and can throw 500 pound rocks at you. And we don't have anything with that big of a bullet. <laughs> yeah, but let me ask you I mean, really, in your heart, do you believe that if Sasquatch were to come out tomorrow, everyone with a rifle would ha- head out to the woods? I mean, do you really believe that they would do that? I've been a hunter my entire life. I'm, I'm not against hunting in any way, shape, or form, but there is always that one guy. <laughs> You know, just like back when um, the buffalo were nearly wiped out and they first opened Yellowstone Park to try to protect them, they had one guy come in and shot as many as he possibly could the first day before he got caught. So, they're, they're, you know, it only takes really one to cause the damage. And, you know, if they wound one or even if they kill one and there are survivors, then that's just going to piss off the rest of them. And you're going to end up with having aggressive ones and attacks and stuff. I, I I hear that the main place where they have really super aggressive ones is in the southern United States, uh, all in areas where the Civil War took place. Lord only knows how many of them might have been shot back then. And so they're probably still aggressive, and that's one of the reasons why I believe that they're more human than anything else is I think they actually have an oral history of their interactions with people and that's why the ones that have had peaceful interactions tend to remain peaceful until they have an excuse to do otherwise and the ones that have had violent interactions tend to be violent until they have an excuse to do something else which they probably never will (laughs) if there are more people though i mean you come across bad people you come across good people too i don't believe that there are people but let's just assume that they are um, I, you know, you're going to get good and bad people. And I just have a, I, and maybe I'll disagree with you on that, Robert. I have a hard time believing most hunters that I know, I'll say 99% of hunters I know, they have a thing about them to where they don't just shoot it at anything. I mean, most hunters I've come across are pretty, I'm trying to think of the ethical is the word I'm looking for. They're pretty ethical people. And, you know, you get one idiot out there that goes and decides he's going to go, hang one on his wall, he might be writing his own uh, death warrant going out and doing something like that. He's going to find out real quick uh, that gun's not going to, I mean, look at the Ape Canyon story. You know, those guys would have been outside that cabin. Every one of them would have been dead. And Exactly. And that would be, you know, the most likely result. Because, like, when I ran into him, it, it wasn't one. It was a whole family. You know, if you find the outlier... Like that guy that opened up on the one with the the SKS on your previous show. Yeah, I understand that he jumped out of his skin, scared the crap out of him, and he dumped a mag into it. Uh, that would be really easy to do if I wasn't so worried about what the, what the others are going to do. <laughs> it would be really easy to get that scared and do that, but I'm more afraid of what the rest of them would do when they came back. <laughs> well, because yeah. They don't. They don't just run alone. They are actually very family-oriented, and they will protect each other. They seem to be, and I agree with you on that. They definitely seem to be. And, and I, you know, I'm glad that night that you went out, especially when you were trying to teach this young guy, here's kind of how you walk silently through the forest. Here's kind of, here's a cold camp. Here's that you kept your head about you because that situation could have gone bad pretty quick. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and you fired yeah, if into. I, the... If I'd fired into the woods and even got close to one, I think it would have really gone south quick. <laughs> and that's also why I told him not to shoot anything unless it was physically attacking him, which I've pretty much adopted. A, unless I'm actually, you know, hunt. if I'm deer hunting and I see a deer, yeah, I'm going to shoot the deer and take it home and eat. But um, if I run into predators in the woods, I've held two bear at gunpoint until they decided to go away. It was just like, okay, your move, you decide. You want to charge me, I'm going to fire. If you walk away, I walk away. No problem. (laughs) Done the same thing with mountain lions. But because I wasn't actually hunting them, they weren't what I was looking for. I figure if, if they're not attacking me, I have no reason to harm them. And I just basically, that's, my general policy. (laughs) No, I agree with you on that. I agree with you. I I mean, I think that's the right attitude to have. And, you know, with Sasquatch, like I said, things can change on a dime. You know, one can make a mistake and really come in and, 
you know, and humans can make a mistake too in that situation and ignite the fire. And thank God that night went relatively smooth. I mean, you guys left, you went, and even when you went back, you know, and seeing that one sleeping, I find that fascinating. I ran into a guy in Texas who told me a similar story. He was, he crossed, I know exactly where he was at and I've talked about it before. And he said it was in the middle of these ferns just sleeping kind of out in the open, but not really in the open. And it was just sleeping on the ground. And because at that time, I assumed that they went to caves or went to higher elevation. And when he kind of showed me the area of where it happened, I was I was surprised. Yeah, I honestly never expected that I would see them in the place that I did because I used to have this theory when I was a kid. I'd always heard and saw any evidence of them was on one particular side of the of the Bonneville power lines. So I assumed that they wouldn't get in between because when I walked underneath the power lines as a kid, I'd always get a headache from the static coming off of them. Yeah. And I thought, you know, if I'm, I live around electricity and this is bothering me this much, something that lives in the woods is probably going to be bothered even worse and not bother. And so that was another reason for my denial at first, because it kind of went against my theory. But after that, I put some time into doing a little bit of research, and I found out that the power lines on the other side had been shut down for maintenance, and therefore they weren't active for a while. So I don't know if they crossed under them at that point and basically kind of got stuck between them until they were willing to deal with it or have a reason to leave. But every time that I've run into them since, they've been in between the two. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Well, if you ever go back to that area, let me know, Robert. I, I'd love to hear any updates. I realize it's been like 25 years, but they're probably still in that area, uh, that family Yeah, group. I think so, because there is a large area right in there that's um, still pretty wild where there's no houses or anything. It's just there is a way I could get into it by bypassing around on one road and into another, and I may eventually end up doing it. Um, I can't convince my wife to go into the woods with me at all because she's kind of of, of, your opinion, of your previous opinion that, you know, these are monsters and she doesn't want anything to do with them. <laughs> the last time I, I was even close to that area, I was with my son, who was only two. I, had, I was riding down the new road that goes back there for a housing development and passed within, oh, probably almost over the top of where I'd seen the one sleeping, but at that time it was forest. <laughs> now it's a road and houses and stuff. But it does connect into the, the road that leads back to the valley back there. The other one, the, the thing that jumped down out of the tree, that's actually the opposite side, and there's a whole set of trails down there. You know, chances are at some point, I, I I love spending time in the woods alone or not. It doesn't bother me. So at some point, I'm sure I'll end up back there or running into them somewhere else again. Yeah. I think that they've gotten to the point where they're really not afraid of me either. I think we're kind of have realized that neither one of us wants to hurt the other. So it's not really difficult to get close to them anymore. <laughs> But, like, I, they generally don't let me necessarily get close enough to see them. It's more a case of hearing them or whatever. When I get too close, so they'll drop out of a tree or or leave or whatever. Who knows? I mean, I may end up running face-to-face -face with one at some point. <laughs> yeah, well, be careful if you do. And I really appreciate your time, and thanks for coming on the show, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. Become a member, get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. Thank you.